Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, to this Pan African Thoracic Society webinar, uh, co-sponsored by AstraZeneca on uh, inhaler reliever use in asthma. Now, my name is Eric Bateman. I'm past professor of pulmonology at the University of Cape Town and the founding director of the University of Cape Town Lung Institute. I've also had a very long association with the Global Initiative for Asthma, which uh, has been an important part of my interest over many years. And we have a lineup of speakers today um, from different countries in Africa, first from South Africa, then Kenya, and then from Ghana. And uh, between them, they will address the issue of reliever use in Africa. Now, it may sound like a strange title, so I think I need to introduce why it's an issue. It's come to it's come to our attention over many years that abuse of or overuse of or reliance on short-acting beta agonists, the, the familiar salbutamol, the blue inhaler, whatever you want to call it, although it gives instant relief, is really not the answer for asthma. Uh, and it may be responsible for unnecessary morbidity and mortality particularly when it, it is the only treatment available, which is, of course, the case in many parts of Africa. And this has become so important that it's led to major changes in international guidelines. The Global Initiative for Asthma in 2018 uh, came up with a statement that a Saba reliever, a Salbutamol reliever, should never be used alone, but should always be accompanied by a low dose of an inhaled corticosteroid. In other words, even for relief, it should be con should be given with an inhaled steroid, which of course quite revolutionizes the way we thought of asthma, especially in Africa. And so it's very relevant as this movement takes place throughout the world that we review what's happening in Africa today. And our first speaker is well positioned to do so. Dr. Clifford Smith from Johannesburg has been a pulmonologist qualified at the Witwatersrand University. He's been in practice for 30 years, so he has a very good grasp of uh, the, the current situation, at least in South Africa. He's also led an important study uh, looking at uh, res uh, reliever use in South Africa as part of an international study, and I'm sure you'll refer to that. So without any further ado, I hand over to Clifford Smith to give us the first talk. Now, note we'll have three talks uh, from our three speakers, then we'll have 20 minutes for questions. And I'd ask you to use the chat box to pose the questions and we'll deal with them at the end. So please keep the questions coming. There's no question that's unimportant. They're all important. And we will attempt to answer it in our discussion at the end of the meeting. So first over to Dr. Smith. Great. Um, thank you very much. Um, Prof, let me get my slides up. Great. Thank you. To discuss what happens in South Africa, what uh, are the treatment programs and how are we doing it? in South Africa. Are we getting it right? So, before we go on, we need to have a look-see. My disclaimer slide, this is uh, my opinion and not those of, of AstraZeneca. So, let's first look at short-acting bronchodilator use in asthma. And, as you've heard, there is an increased risk of exacerbation or mortality with regular or overuse of short-acting bronchodilators. And this was shown as early as 2012. And this led, as you heard, to the GINA guidelines suggesting that the recommendations to use inhaled corticosteroids with SABA alone and not um, with SABA uh, itself and to use the inhaled steroids. So let's look at this further. Why is there this potential overreach and the significant over-reliance on SABAs? Well, 
we did the study that Prof Bateman re, uh, alluded to that SARB overuse is common in all grades of asthma severity, and this has been shown in the past. Uh, this is overprescribed by doctors and is associated with over-the-counter purchase. Why is that the case? Well, simple. It works well. It relieves symptoms. Patients are aware that it relieves symptoms. The doctors have been taught that bronchospasm is an integral part of asthma, and we use short-acting bronchodilators. Patients can access it freely without a prescription. As we said, it's cheap, certainly a major factor in, in Africa, and it's historically been scripted as first-line therapy. So how bad is this problem? Let's look at Southern Africa, uh, and we'll look at some of the, the, the data internationally as well. When we first looked at this, and I first was involved with the study, I, uh, the title was Sabina, and I initially thought, gee, this is interesting. What does a, a, a witch have to do with this? But Sabina stands for short acting bronchodilator use in asthma. And let's look at the trials that were done related to the short acting bronchodilator use. This study uh, was published by Prof. Bateman and really looks at the impact of short acting bronchodilators on asthma control. And this is the global study. And I just want to point out to you. Third from the top, South Africa. Well, here South Africa is a world leader, not only in, in sports, in some sports, but certainly in short-acting bronchodilator use. And to summarize what the global study had shown is that 38% of people use more than three canisters per year, but in the study from South Africa, this was a leader of 75%. And more than 10 canisters at 56%. And that's highlighted at the top. So, looking at uh, the study that was done in South Africa, the overall result was that 75% of patients receive more than three short acting bronchodilators canisters per year. And let's look at this in more detail. In the purple is all of the uh, patients. The blue bars, primary care, and the light blue specialist care. And as a total, we can see a lot of the therapy, 10 to 12 canisters per year was in a significant amount of patients. Let's look at this though for more mild asthma and moderate to severe, and what was the difference? So here in mild asthma, we see a significant amount of bronchodilator therapy, short-acting bronchodilator canisters prescribed per year. Up to 75-77% of patients needed more than 10 or 12 per year, less so in the specialist care and more so in the primary care patients. What about moderate to severe asthma? This shows, uh, not, uh, not uh, unexpectedly, less short-acting bronchodilator use, but still a significant amount, presumably related to more controller therapy. So significant amounts through all the way through. So what were the highlights of the South African study? And I don't want to go through the individual details, it'll take too long. But the overall result or, or conclusions is that SARB use is common in all grades of severity of asthma. It's over prescribed by doctors. And there's a significant over the counter purchase of SARBs. And just to remind you, 75% of patients were prescribed more than three canisters in one year, as compared to the global incidence of 38%. So certainly a large amount of SABA overuse. And 27% of the OTC purchase was without a script. So looking at all of this, how can we eradicate or control the SABA use, overuse? What, what are the possible ways around this? Well, firstly, to adopt the anti-inflammatory reliever therapy, which, as you heard, was uh, alluded to by Prof. Bateman with the GINA strategy. And this is important. I just want to look at this in more detail. For those of you who haven't seen this, you can download it from the uh, GINA website. And the important part here is that if you look at track one, which is the preferred approach to use an inhaled steroid with, with formoterol, a rapid acting and long acting bronchodilator, rapid onset. Here, in step one, in mildest of asthma, we'd use ICS and formoterol alone as needed. 
and if you're more severe, the doses will be increased and you'll go to step 3, 4, and 5. If, for whatever reason, you need to use the alternate group, alternate track 2 therapy, the important part here, as was highlighted, in step 1, the most mild of patients, we should use a SABA with an ICS. And that has some implications for compliance. You'll need two inhalers if you don't have it as a single inhaler. And then as if you, if you have more severe asthma, you'll have your low-dose maintenance steroids, again, with your ICS SARB as reliever or as needed SARB. So the mind shift here is that mild asthma should always have a bronchodilator with an inhaled steroid. This was echoed in an update that was published in 2021 from the South African Thoracic Society. Don't want to go through this in detail, but the same thing applies. In step one and step two highlighted above, all patients will need low dose inhaled corticosteroid with formoterol or alternatively the ICS and SABA. Right, so how can we eradicate or control this overuse? To follow the anti-inflammatory reliever therapy would certainly be uh, necessary. What are the obstacles to this? Well, the elephant in the room is obviously the cost of this, and that may be uh, difficult to apply in certain circumstances where their drug formularies, either in the state hospital or in private clinics and private medical aids. There may be alternatives using inhaled corticosteroids with um, short-acting bronchodilators other than formoterol, which are not available in South Africa. And also the obstacle is the doctor and patient bias. Uh, short-acting bronchodilators have been historically used with abandon. All right, what else may we be able to do? Well, if short-acting bronchodilators are overused, can we limit access and promote the safety concerns that have been shown with SARBs? Well, what's possible? We could have black box warning labels, but this may be difficult to institute. Certainly patients who have chronic obstructive lung disease may need their SARBs alone. Uh, we could reduce the OTC availability. Uh, limit scripts, pharmacy warnings, and pharmacy education. And this is important both for physicians and pharmacists as an ongoing method of getting the, the, the short-acting bronchodilator use story. Right, what else? Well, they've been adopted. There's a global quality of care standards which have been published to empower self-care. And I'll just go through this with you. Um, this was looked at in, in two studies shown below. And the messages of the global quality of care is to improve the diagnosis. Sounds easy, but not always uh, possible to do in, in situations where you don't have all the, the right equipment, peak flows or flow volume curves. The message is to treat inflammation, and that SABA alone is not the right treatment. And important to follow up for a chronic illness. Patient comes for a cough with bronchitis, follow them up. And then post-exacerbation of asthma, you need your therapy to prevent further flare-ups. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we certainly may need innovative methods to distribute this quality of care standard to pharmacists, to doctors, and to patients. What about direct messaging to patients? This is contentious. Certainly in some countries in the United States, Advertising to consumer on all media fronts are, are, are possible, not so much in, in many countries in Africa, or with questionnaires. So what is available for you, practically? Well, there are certain questionnaires. This is a short-acting bronchodilator reliance questionnaire, which would make your patient and you more aware of their overuse of short-acting bronchodilators. And this is something practical you could have in your clinic, or in your patient in your doctor's rooms to aware make the patient more aware and you you're more aware of what's going on. So the most important part of this is that if we're going to control SARB overuse, clinicians must be central to drive this. We need to be aware of the anti-inflammatory reliever therapy program, the importance of trying to limit patients' access to short-acting bronchodilator overuse. Tell them about the safety concerns, and it's all very well when patients come for follow-up, how's your asthma? No, I'm great. Is to actually go in more detail. How often do you use your short-acting bronchodilator? Often we don't do that. Remember about the global quality of care standards, 
and think of innovative methods of messaging this information to our patients and pharmacists. And uh, the central drive must be ours. So I'd like to leave it there and we can certainly have questions and comments and uh, I've gone through this uh, reasonably uh, thoroughly, but we need to have more questions as time permits at the end of the talk. I'll then hand back to Prof Bateman. Thank you, Clifford, for getting us off to a start uh, on this topic. So we've, we've heard that uh, quite briefly, but importantly, that SABA overuse and over-reliance is responsible for a lot of the continuing mortality in, uh, in asthma. Uh, secondly, we've heard that the situation in South Africa uh, is, is very unfortunate, that over-prescribing of SABA is very endemic. 75% of patients getting uh, many more SABAs or relying more on SABAs than on other treatments. And then he has suggested some ways that we may start to address that. And that's, I think, what we will come on to as we get into question time. So now we're going to have a perspective from Kenya. And it's a great pleasure to, to welcome uh, uh, Dr. Jeremiah Chikaya, who is very well known not only in Kenya and in Africa, but around the world. Uh, I've met him on many fora, and he's done very sentinel work in tuberculosis control, uh, but also for chronic respiratory diseases, including asthma. Uh, he has a number of prizes from distinguished organizations like the ATS for International Health. And, uh, and he is in practice currently uh, and acting as the executive director of the uh, Kenya, the Respiratory Society of Kenya. He's also played, he's just recent past president of the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, which, which has recently come out with uh, some very important quality standards that we will discuss later. But, for, but uh, let me not say more and hand over to Dr. Chukaya. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Eric, for uh, the very warm and kind uh, introduction and very good words. I would want to start by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, at this webinar. Um, as I expected, being the second speaker and not having shared slides with Clifford, uh, our Dr. Smith, before he started his uh, presentation, there will be some um, um, uh, some repetition, so you will uh, forgive all of us for, for that. Uh, this is my disclaimer. Um, this is uh, all my opinion, and uh, it has nothing to do with the, uh, this is not the opinion of those who are sponsoring this webinar. I thought maybe I would start by highlighting to us and reminding us of the burden of asthma in the African continent. Um, Many of you will know that uh, uh, there was a, uh, a global asthma network and a study that tried to estimate the global burden of asthma uh, and also the global burden of disease uh, work that uh, uh, occurs regularly has also tried to estimate uh, the burden of asthma around the world. The figures are a little different from one source to another, but generally speaking, asthma is a big problem uh, globally, uh, maybe more than 300 million people have this disease, and it contributes about 1% of global dollars. In the African setting, several years ago, uh, Professor Ad Deloye uh, came up with this systematic review that, for me, uh, is um, an important reminder that uh, um, asthma is a big problem in the African continent. If you see uh, over the 20-year um, period between 1990 and 2010, the prevalence of asthma in the African continent was estimated to have uh, increased from about 74 million people to 110 million people. If that trend has continued up to now, then we do have a real big problem of this disease uh, in our continent. Uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, the burden of asthma in Kenya. Uh, we participated in the famous Isaac one and three studies that were done uh, in several decades ago. Uh, and if you look at uh, WIS 
uh, in the last uh, 12 months, which was uh, how asthma was diagnosed in young people aged between 13 and 14. There were quite high rates of, uh, uh, of this disease uh, in the capital, uh, Nairobi, and in one of our cities in the western part of Kenya. And uh, these rates increased in five years from 17.1% in Nairobi, for example, uh, to 18%. Uh, and from 10.4% in Eldoret, a city in the western part of Kenya, to 13%. More recently, a group of people have looked at uh, um, uh, the burden of asthma in a population in one of our counties, again in, western, in the western part of Kenya. They did a cluster randomized cross-sectional study in that part of the world, studied about 392 people uh, and uh, uh, over the age of 12, and 21.7% of these individuals were um, classified as having asthma. So that's a real big problem. If 21.7% of your adult population uh, has asthma, then you do have a big problem. Um, we recently also um, did some work in the East African region to look at uh, asthma severity in a research program that involved uh, three countries, uh, Ethiopia, Uganda, and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and Kenya. We were calling this the African Severe Asthma Program. Uh, we did uh, study about a thousand people with asthma, uh, unfortunately, this study was only done in tertiary care facilities, basically the APEX facilities in all the three countries. However, if you look at the figures that we got, uh, they are very worrying. 25.6% of our patients were classified to have severe asthma by month 12 or follow-up. And about 5% of them were classified to have severe refractory asthma by month 12. Now, why were we calling these individuals as uh, people with severe asthma? Uh, we tried, we recruited people into the study and tried as much as we can to provide them with guidelines recommended treatment. So each of these were given guidelines recommended treatment. And by the end of the 12 month period of follow-up, they were ideally meant to be controlled but we had up to 25.6% of people who were not controlled, and some of them were really having problems with their asthma, nearly 5% of them. So uh, this is not a minor problem in the African setting, and certainly not uh, a minor problem uh, in the Kenyan setting. So how do we provide care uh, in the African setting? I think they are peculiar peculiarities in the African setting that we need to be very familiar with. One of those is the fact that we are providing care in a setting of high levels of poverty. It's estimated that nearly uh, 500 million people in Africa are living in extreme poverty. Most countries in Africa currently ex uh, are experiencing high debt distress. The World Bank has estimated that the economic growth will slow down in the African setting. You have rapid urbanization with expansion of urban slum population and very weak healthcare systems in terms of infrastructure, human resources, and so on and so forth. So that is the setting in which we are providing care for most people with asthma uh, in the African uh, continent. And uh, unfortunately, the African continent is not making as much progress as it should make with the sustainable development goal, uh, goal target number one, which is uh, elimination of extreme poverty. Uh, the World Bank is telling us that up to 35, up to uh, uh, a large majority, nearly 50% of our countries have extreme poverty rates of uh, over 35%, which is very worrying indeed. So what does this mean for Africa? While it's not clear if uh, uh, poverty increases incidence or prevalence of asthma, we know that poverty has a relationship with the uh, morbidity and mortality for asthma. Uh, there is um, um, underdiagnosis and inadequate treatment for asthma. So in uh, essence, a lot of our people will not be well controlled or will not achieve control of asthma because of some of those problems. 
This slide you've already seen, and I'm not going to go into it, just to uh, reiterate uh, the message that uh, uh, Dr. Smith has just said, that uh, uh, the use of SABA uh, is no longer recommended and has not been recommended for several years now. But how is asthma treated in Africa now, uh, including in my country, Kenya? Uh, many of you may have seen this work that was published recently, uh, uh, which is uh, part of the Global uh, Asthma Network. Uh, and this particular um, paper was uh, looking at how people were being treated for asthma uh, around the world. Uh, there were um, 25 countries that participated in this work. And in Africa, they were we had representation from South Africa, Cameroon, and Nigeria. And look at uh, the rates of uh, SABA use alone. Up to 85% of participants were on SABA alone. ICS use was used in a rather small proportion of individuals, including individuals who had severe asthma, who you do not want to, uh, uh, to give only SABAs alone. And then uh, uh, we are still using oral SABAs and oral theophilines in many countries, which is, uh, uh, which is not uh, um, that exciting. Uh, this has been mentioned. There's been uh, the um, short-acting short bronchodilator use in, in asthma uh, international study. There's been three phases of that um, of this work. Sabina one, which was mainly a UK study. Sabina two, that was carried out in Europe, Canada, and Israel. And Sabina three, in which we had the opportunity in Africa to participate. And I will very, very briefly try and summarize some of the work that came out of Sabina 3. This has already been presented uh, by Dr. Smith and I will not, uh, uh, I will not uh, uh, spend too much time here, but just to show you that overuse of SABA is a very common problem around the world. This is what we had from the African cohort uh, in Sabina, in Sabina uh, 3. Uh, in Sabina 3, we had Kenya, South Africa, and Egypt participating. Uh, and if you look at the individuals who have, uh, uh, who had, um, who received more than three canisters of uh, Saba in a year, which is uh, what most people would accept as overuse uh, of uh, Saba, then we have a big problem. Nearly 50%, 46.5% of individuals were getting more than three canisters of SABA in, uh, in a year. And almost a quarter of these individuals were getting about uh, more than 10, uh, 10 canisters of, uh, of SABA uh, in, uh, uh, in, um, uh, in a year. Um, uh, so if you look, I mean, if you try and, uh, and, and dissect that in terms of uh, those who had mild to moderate and severe disease, the situation did not quite change. So you had overuse of SABA throughout all the categories of asthma severity. Uh, to zoom in now on the Kenyan study, uh, the same story happened in Kenya here. You can see that uh, if you just look at um, at, at, at uh, uh, at the first bit of uh, where there is all, uh, at the first bit of all these figures, you can see that uh, those who received more than three uh, canisters uh, of SABA uh, in a year were almost the, the large majority. We had a lot of individuals in Kenya who had uh, uh, SABA overuse, and it didn't matter whether they had mild asthma or moderate to severe asthma. We tried many years ago to try and improve access uh, to inhaled corticosteroids or other inhaled medicines and uh, including inhaled corticosteroids. And we used to actually um, 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 procure these products and, and pass them on to uh, individuals at uh, uh, minimal prices. And you can see this is what was happening to us for uh, several years that if you compare the sale of uh, inhaled corticosteroids versus the sale of uh, short-acting beta agonists, there was absolutely no comparison uh, for nearly two years. So SABA use is, uh, uh, is a major problem uh, in our setting. 
This has already been mentioned already. What is the outcome? What does this mean in terms of uh, what happens to people who've been, uh, who are using overuse of SABA? This is some work that was uh, published several years ago, showing that there is a correlation uh, between beta agonist use per month and uh, asthma death. Uh, so yes, the more SABA use you use, uh, the greater the risk of death. Uh, many of you will remember this work of, uh, uh, of uh, the audit of asthma deaths in the UK that showed that um, um, many of the individuals who died, 39% of them had been prescribed more than 12 suburb canisters in the year before they died. Uh, and uh, if you look at, uh, uh, at the Sabina 3 main paper that came out of, uh, uh, of, of, of the Sabina 3 study, there was a correlation or an association between the number of canisters that one was using and uh, the odds of achieving at least being partly controlled uh, asthma. So uh, the more um, sub canisters you are using, the less the odds uh, of having um, controlled or partly controlled asthma. So we know that overuse of SABAs have been asso associated with bronchial hyperresponsiveness. Sorry about that. Uh, has been uh, associated with increased proportion of asthma patients who have moderate to severe disease. Um, uh, has been uh, associated with reduced uh, protection from bronchoconstrictor stimuli, and it may mask uh, uh, worsening asthma. So the question is, what can we then do uh, to reduce uh, SABA overuse? In Kenya, we've had only discussions about these things. Uh, in January last year, courtesy of AstraZeneca, uh, there was a group of people who met somewhere to discuss about uh, how we could, in fact, uh, reduce SABA overuse in the, in, in, in the Kenyan setting. And we thought that there were four key things that uh, we could do. One of those was policy level intervention to ensure that lung diseases beyond TB are given appropriate attention. We have a TB program here that focuses only on TB. If you have asthma, the clinical experience of many of us is that uh, if you are not careful, you could end up being treated for TB because that's all that uh, um, our healthcare workers in the public healthcare system, especially lower levels of the public healthcare system know about. Uh, maybe there should be um, a policy to control over the counter access to uh, short acting beta 2 agonists. Uh, we thought that we should revise our guidelines and we did that to reflect the situation, the international recommendation but much more importantly, uh, one needs to also address common asthma care bottlenecks, like the misconceptions about asthma uh, in health medications, uh, both by healthcare providers and also uh, the, the community. And then uh, data, we don't really have data on health resource utilization in this country. No one can tell anyone uh, how many people with asthma uh, attended outpatient departments or hospitalized or died of this disease uh, um, uh, in this country at this moment in time. And we need that kind of data to be able to advocate uh, to the authorities uh, to ensure that asthma care uh, is uh, prioritized. And then awareness creation among all stakeholders, including the general population. Those were the key things that we thought we needed to do to reduce suburb overuse in our setting. So in conclusion, uh, I think these are things that Dr. Smith has already talked to you about, uh, but uh, yes, suburb overuse is common across the world. Um, it does appear to increase with an increase in gene treatment step. Uh, uh, um, suburb overuse is associated with reduced odds of achieving asthma control and increased risk of severe exacerbation and even death, and therefore reducing overuse of these uh, um, 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 medicines is an important uh, imperative for asthma care and control. Thank you very much, and I will be happy to participate in the question and answer session. Back to you, Professor Bateman. Thank you, Dr. Chukai, for a wonderful talk, um, giving us a perspective 
of Africa in general and important data from Kenya, just illustrating the issues we're having to deal with. And I particularly loved the some of the suggestions of what needed to be a, a addressed. And I think we'll return to that, I think, in our question time. But uh, we'll move on now to get a pediatric perspective uh, uh, from uh, from Dr. Sandra Kwarteng Owusi, who she who's a pediatric pulmonologist in the Department of Child Health in the Kung Fu Anyoya Teaching Hospital in Kumasi. Um, Dr. Owusi has, has, uh, is involved in a lot of research, particularly around asthma. Um, and so she's gained a lot of experience in that. Uh, she helped to set up the pulmonary division within her institution uh, and networks with a number of researchers around the world and within Africa. So she is very well positioned. Now, it's interesting that the recommendations uh, from Gina and that have been put in place in uh, about 122 countries of the world um, has, has for the moment largely left out the pediatric population because of lack of uh, grade A or very high quality evidence. And so we're in sort of an interregnum between what has been recommended for adults and adolescents and what is being recommended for children. So let's get the perspective now from, from an expert uh, from the African continent. Uh, Sandra, would you just put your slides on full screen and then it's over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I hope I'm being heard. Um, I'm grateful to the leadership of the Pan-African Thoracic Society for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation on pediatric asthma in Africa. So a brief of an overview of what we are discussing as I've been asked to talk about pediatric asthma treatment. So I am making this presentation uh, as for educational purposes, and I have no conflict of interest to declare. So we know the definition of asthma as a heterogeneous condition. It is complex. It involves the airway. We want to highlight that the cardinal features of asthma are the airways inflammation, and then there's reversible airflow obstruction, and there's also bronchial hyperresponsiveness. More importantly, we want to highlight that the issue of asthma is within the airways and not outside the airways. So I know this paper has been highlighted um, L by this paper by Louis Gracia and Philippa L. Wood, and also Prof. Masakela, highlighting the fact that we really are challenged with um, asthma treatment when it comes to use of inhaled corticosteroids, that SABA um, is still highly overused so much. Um, and the need also to highlight that there's a lot of severe asthma symptoms because there's a lot of absence of use of inhaled corticosteroids. And that poor asthma control is also highly prevalent in um, lower middle income countries. And this is important, especially for pediatric asthma. So we, our group in Ghana has been involved in this study, the Acacia study, which was looking at achieving control of asthma in children in Africa. And um, the results would um, be shared soon in papers that are coming up. But I would highlight uh, some of the major findings of Acacia as I present also um, a bit more unofficially. So in pediatric asthma treatment, we highlight that the pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic components are all very important. So factors that influence pediatric asthma treatment. So even before we initiate inhaled corticosteroid therapy, even before the patient sits in front of the doctor, for the doctor to have the opportunity to manage the asthma, there, there are many challenges that the earlier speakers have also sought to highlight about the very high cost of asthma medications. For instance, in Ghana, it's, it's difficult to access asthma medication, especially for the pediatric population. 
Despite the health insurance system, it has been a great battle in terms of getting asthma medications for children to be listed on the, the health insurance scheme. And this contributes to delays in initiating um, asthma treatment for children. We also highlight that health systems are poorly structured to support pediatric asthma care, and that asthma clinics across Africa tend to be only um, centered in the teaching hospitals, which are based in the major cities, and that primary health care staff let, uh, tend to have very little expertise for long-term asthma management, especially in children. Community factors, as I said, from our Acacia study, we realized that stigma is still a major issue in the communities. Many children, as I term them, the unreached children who haven't even presented to our health facilities, share their experiences showing that there's severe asthma symptoms, and yet these children are never presented to the healthcare facilities. Many children have never seen a doctor, and asthma is not realized as a complete disease that needs long-term management. Many opportunities are missed because health workers refuse or do not initiate inhaled corticosteroid therapy. And for pediatric asthma management, the other problem is that mostly when it is initiated, wrong devices are applied to, to, to you. So we realize that children will need specialized devices as I will highlight. So in terms of pediatric asthma treatment, what are the practical steps that needs to be highlighted? So I just want to say that if as health workers, when we find a child with asthma in front of us, we need to provide education for the family. And usually this opportunity is missed. We need to discuss continuous care and we need to highlight the need for adherence to controller therapy rather than short acting beta agonist use. And then also to make the major plea that clinicians must spend time to teach children the right techniques for inhaler in, inhaled corticosteroid use. We need to also highlight impairment and risk. So impairment, for instance, is that we want to manage pediatric asthma so there are no daytime symptoms, that children can have full school participation, and also risks that they do not have frequent attacks and they can have normal development. I wish to highlight that in managing pediatric asthma, our target must be to bring down airways inflammation because that is the only way we can achieve control. So as has been mentioned by the earlier speakers, this landmark paper by Gina recommends that all children, all adults with asthma needs to be initiated on inhaled corticosteroids um, and it can be as needed or for continuous therapy depending on the severity. Inhaled corticosteroids represents a milestone in asthma control, and it is the gold medal for asthma management. And we need to highlight this as often as we see the children and their families present to us in our consulting rooms. We need to highlight that controller therapy is what will bring inflammation down. And we need to sort of highlight the seesaw approach that if we are using controller therapy very well, there will be very little need to use bronchodilators because bronchodilators have no effect on inflammation and cannot help to achieve asthma control in the pediatric population. This has also been highlighted, I guess maybe even newer steps, but just to highlight that Gina is asking us to use symptoms to initiate treatment for um, children 12 to 14 years and even for those also younger, that our patients must be managed with a stepwise approach. Adolescent asthma management must be targeted at a stepwise approach. And we also need to highlight that in some of these children, they can use the as needed low dose inhaled corticosteroid for motoral combination, even as reliever, because many times 
the rush to use Saba is, is so much predominant, especially in the adolescent population, obviously, because we know that that's a very difficult age group to manage. And also for the younger children, Gina also recommends the stepwise approach. I need to highlight that actually for our children in, in Africa, for instance, in our clinic, with over the last 15 years of managing children with asthma, we only have about 5% of our children with severe asthma symptoms needing the step four and the step five. But if we really are doing controller therapy well, most of our children between six to 11 years will be between steps two and step three. We also need to highlight that it is also important to step down when control has been achieved so that the family has hope that with symptom control, we actually need less of medication. Oral corticosteroid use is so highly predominant among pediatric population. And we must highlight that the need for to achieve asthma control would be done if we use inhaled corticosteroids well, rather than give frequent courses of oral um, corticosteroids, which has so many side effects and are also not helpful. We must also highlight that children are not all in the same age bracket. So for children younger than, than 10 years, we need to highlight that, for instance, the table haler and the discus may not be the best. And so the, the age of the patient must be made a major consideration for selecting the type of device. And we must ensure that patients can actually use the device that we are, we are prescribing for them. So for the younger age group, spaces are necessary. Spaces are important in improving bronchodilator um, inhaled corticosteroid deposition in the lungs. And we must highlight that this is important. We need to spend time to teach children to do this correctly. It may be, I say to the, my team members that if all we do in the clinic is to ensure that, that these devices are being used correctly, that, that is good. Rather than do the fast approach because our clinics get too busy. And from time to time, we need to assess control. So this simplified GINA document that helps us to categorize our patients into well-controlled, partly controlled and uncontrolled, which will be the precursor for deciding to step up or step down must be used. I mean, this is really simplified and because it just reviews the period in the last four weeks, it helps to prevent recall bias. And we must actively assess control because it is the degree to which manifestation of asthma symptoms are minimized by treatment. It is very dynamic. So your patient may come in well controlled and another time may be partly controlled, but we need to frequently document these and give feedback to the patient so they know how well they are doing. Also in pediatric asthma management, we need to highlight that comorbidities are a reality and that we should be attentive to comorbidities because the comorbidities can influence how much we are able to achieve control. So allergic comorbidities such as allergic rhinitis may actually be prevalent amongst the patients with asthma actually many months before asthma diagnosis is officially made. So we need to make sure that we do the correct thing by reviewing for comorbidities. We must also highlight that amongst the children in our clinics, for instance, presence of allergic comorbidities in children with asthma um, was really a, a, a prevalent. So children with allergic rhinitis, for instance, were a lot among this 83 that we reviewed over a short period. So we need to highlight that comorbidities are a reality and we must attend to comorbidities as another way to achieve control. Some of the comorbidities may also be non-allergic. So for instance, reflux and obstructive sleep apnea, we need to ask questions from the children as we see them to be able to decide whether these comorbidities are present so that we can address them because they influence control. 
the other aspect which we want we we wish doesn't happen is the treatment of exacerbation and here also we highlight that no child should die if they make it to the hospital with an exacerbation health workers and teams must be resourced to assess in the triaging process immediately our golden moments and to initiate therapy and to ask, decide whether patients need to be referred immediately or they, they need to uh, be, be, be admitted to our facility because this is also important. We also we must highlight to the patient that sometimes exacerbations may happen at home and families need enough information on how much how to manage asthma exacerbations with the correct devices. And we must highlight that SABA use at home is not the remedy. They need to immediately fall back to use of inhaled corticosteroids when patients do not improve. Spirometry is a useful assessment that would support pediatric asthma management, but it's not always available. It, it, it tends to be available in only the major cities, but this is an, a recommendation from ERS and ATS and even PATS as well. And I know PATS is working hard to improve access to spirometry. The use of asthma action plans have also been found to be helpful in the pediatrics population. It's a simplified educational tool that summarizes um, medications, gives some power to the patients to help them decide what to do especially when there's an emergency. So all in all, asthma action plans for children can also be valuable tools in um, childhood asthma management. Um, to summarize, I think we need to keep highlighting that th there's so much that needs to be done as far as childhood asthma management is concerned. And I, I have highlighted the many factors. So if a child presents to the consulting room, that child must, must be the golden child, if I have to say, and that all efforts to achieve control and sustain control is what we need to do if we have to prioritize um, asthma management in children in Africa. Thank you very much for your attention. So I'll stop sharing and I'll hand over to you, Prof. Beatman. Thank you very much uh, uh, for that very useful overview of asthma management in pediatrics, particularly with the emphasis on, Afri uh, on Africa. So now we have plenty of time um, because our speakers have stuck to their time uh, for a, a time of open discussion. And would you please, those who have questions, um, just post them on the chat and we will do our best to handle them. Um, and uh, may I ask uh, Dr. Smith and Dr. Sandra to turn on their cameras. We want to see your faces as we discuss these questions. Um, I wanted to start with uh, going back, I think, perhaps to the first talk uh, and to say, why why is three inhalers in a, of Sava's in a year viewed as overuse? Uh, Clifford, do you want to explain how that works out? Sure. Well, that's thought to be the, the cutoff point where you have excess mortality and, uh, and morbidity from your asthma. And it really purports the degree of control and uh, the need for therapy. A lot of people use their short-acting bronchodilators as a crutch uh, as opposed to um, needing their therapy, particularly for exercise. I see a lot of people who will use their short-acting bronchodilator treatment um, before they do their, their competitive sports, they want to have an extra edge. They may not really need therapy. So that'll be in the, the lower amount of uh, less than three canisters per year. But that's really the, the uh, above that is, is associated with poor outcome and relates to the lack of asthma control or uh, asthma inflammatory control therapy. Right. And, and what do you think happens uh, during an attack. Can you describe Saba use leading up to an attack and what the sure. potential is if they don't, uh, you know, whether it delays them getting to, to hospital or to, to, to get yeah. proper care? 
Yeah, I think that's a vitally important question. You know, the, the person who's used to their short-acting bronchodilator as a relief will have an asthma attack at home and use their short-acting bronchodilator, have some subjective response, and may end up using more and more, and that's been well shown that that will happen. And uh, the inflama inflammatory component is not adequately treated, leading to them either dying at home or ending up in, in the hospital ICU with an exacerbation. And that points to the um, need for the anti-inflammatory therapy, which is reasonably easy to give if it's in combination with your short-acting bronchodilator. And that may abort the asthma attack, the need for emergency therapy admission, and uh, hopefully for asthma deaths in that situation. So that points very strongly to uh, poor asthma control and managing just the symptoms and not the pathology. Yes, I mean, it's quite sobering. The WHO estimates of global burdens of disease shows that 95% of asthma deaths in the world are in low middle income countries. Or, or uh, And that really shows that there's a burden of deaths that we really haven't monitored. I think uh, Dr. Chikai referred to that when he said we lack the statistics to to know the full impact of the imperfect treatment we're giving. Do you want to comment further on that, uh, Dr. Chikai? You know um, how big, how many people are are unrecognized as dying from asthma in Africa? You're on mute. Uh, just speaking, on. speaking, first of all, from my own country, um, like I said in, in the talk, health resource utilization for asthma is not captured. Uh, in our recording and reporting systems, all we have is something that says uh, you came in because of a respiratory illness and the respiratory illness is not named. Um, so and then we don't have vital registration of you know, data systems. I mean, most of Africa, I think South Africa, you're trying a little bit, you may have vital registration systems, but the, the rest of Africa is struggling. There are no vital registration systems. So it's a dark kind of thing. We don't know how many people are um, being admitted to hospital because of a severe exacerbations of asthma, how many people are dying. Um, and, and so, um, what uh, I think what most people are doing right now to estimate the burden of, uh, or rather the mortality estimates for, uh, for asthma in, in countries like ours is based on modeling and assumptions and water view rather than actual data from uh, health resource utilization, which is a big thing that I think we need to address. Well, that's, that's quite a chilling statement, isn't it? It means it's a silent epidemic. We don't, we don't actually know. We know who's dying of TB and HIV, but we don't know who's dying of respiratory diseases in a disease where, where every death is viewed as unnecessary. It's a thoroughly treatable disease. And uh, I guess for me, that's, that's going to be our big challenge, how we, do, uh, how we monitor in order to be able to make a case for improving treatment. So what would you, as the three speakers, what would you say about the adequacy of provision for, for, of medications for asthma? I mean, is it, is it reasonable to suggest that if you can't afford more, just give them SABAs? What, what do you think about that statement? I, I think we have to change the discussion uh, about, or rather the narrative about uh, asthma care. It's really not about, about uh, um, uh, you know, just simple symptom control. Uh, and yes, we know that the majority of people with asthma in the world have mild disease, but mild disease does not mean no exacerbation, does not mean no death. That we know, we've, we've seen that kind of data from, from other places. And I think it's really important for people to know that uh, providing people with the right kind of treatment prevents hospitalization, prevents exacerbation, prevents death, and may have a huge benefit in terms of uh, um, economic benefits and, and stuff like that. But what we probably need to do, in my view, and we were we are trying to do this kind of thing here in Kenya, 
is have one or two places in the country where we record people who come into the facility because of an asthma exacerbation and use that data as an advocacy thing that we can uh, then press our government and what have you to make sure that they provide the right treatment for people with asthma. Right, right. So we have a question in the chat box. Um, how do you prioritize? Uh, how, how can we prioritize ICS therapy in, in people in a setting where these, this drug is not available? Can we resort to oral corticosteroids? So is oral corticosteroids an alternative? Anybody like to address that? How about first from a pediatric point of view? Yeah, thank you, Prof. Bateman. So I think, I mean, oral corticosteroids have some role in asthma management, but it is on the very short term basis as Gina recommends. And so I think it's difficult to just say not available. ICS not available. So resort to use of oral corticosteroids because if you go to more than three short courses per year, then that's also becoming an issue. So can we begin to open this discussion with our with our health authorities, for instance, in Ghana, and I think the discussion with with the um, health insurance schemes, although they suffer, and I know that's more like what happens in many other countries, to could to make a push to list asthma medications on 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 the health insurance scheme is is something we need to do. Otherwise, if we just give up and replace inhaled corticosteroid therapy. With, with oral corticosteroids, then, then we've lost the battle entirely because we also tend to see children come in with a lot of side effects because they start using oral corticosteroids and then it becomes the replacement for the, the, the daily control. So in my opinion, I, I think we, we shouldn't stop. We need to push, get to the health authorities. Let, let's do something rather than give up. And, and the patient education bit is also very important to, to, to do because that may also help. If they know this is what they need, then we can begin the discussion as to are they willing, what are the ways to, to, to support them to get the access. But it's not a one answer question do, and I, I guess the other speakers may also make a contribution. Thank yes, you. can I ask, ask uh, Dr. Chukaya just uh, what is your approach when you're forced to use oral corticosteroids as maintenance treatment, or do you never I mean, do that? I, I I never do that. I try not to do that. But we've had this debate I, um, I, even very recently uh, that where uh, inhaled corticosteroids are unavailable, why not to try low doses of oral corticosteroids? And the question is, what is low and what is a safe level of a low dose of an inhaled or of an oral corticosteroid. Um, I remember being a, um, a requested to participate in a multinational study to uh, uh, examine that question. And I humbly said, no, I, I don't think I want to participate in this because it's running away from uh, a basic fact that we need to provide people with an appropriate safe treatment uh, over the long run. So are you going to give people oral corticosteroids for 40 years, for 60 years, and expect that they will not have adverse events? No, these fellows will become very unwell uh, if you give them oral corticosteroids. So for me, it's a, a definite no-go area. I think we need to push our governments, and we can push our governments to provide appropriate treatment for people with asthma. Yes, I must say, I. You know, you're an expert in tuberculosis and HIV and, you know, there we've pulled out all the stops to get the appropriate treatment for that disease. We have abundant evidence now, both research and clinical, that the treatment of asthma involves, has to involve an inhaled steroid, even in the mildest case. And I think that's what Gina is saying. It's saying it's, it's unforgivable to tell our populations, even in Africa, even in the poor countries, that you're doing all right if you just get an, a, a SAVA. Clifford, what is your perspective? You've been practicing a long time. I strongly agree with uh, my two colleagues. We need to go away from the oral steroids. And you, if you explain to your patients 
uh, certainly depends where you work, but you need to have access to inhaled steroids. And most of our patients, either in the uh, private sector and the state sector, will have it. Will make it available. The problem is where patients don't want to use it. They perhaps are have a steroid phobia and refuse to use it. But that's education. And most of the patients in whom I use oral steroids are really our step five patients who uh, have no other alternatives if biologics are not available. But that's not the focus of today's talk. That's the more severe patient. But for the general patient who needs inhaled steroids, that's the way to go. And oral steroids are not uh, are not applicable. Hundred percent agree. Thank you. Um, yeah. So so we focused on two treatments we don't endorse, and yet they're the most widely used in Africa, mm. uh, SABAs. And uh, uh, let's get to ICS and the recommendation of using a, a combination, particularly in mild asthma. Um, we haven't talked a great deal about that. But what do you think the potential of that is in the resource constrained setting? Is it is it a solution? We use combination drugs in TB and in HIV and in hypertension, even in Africa. Uh, is this the equivalent for for asthma? Should it be standard of care like Gina is pushing for? I'll go start there. I really agree that that's the most important and we can make it work. It may be financially driven, but if we can make a combination therapy available, either as an ICS short acting bronchodilator combination or the formoterol inhaled steroid, and we need to push for that. We need to be proactive in having that available as first line therapy. And uh, as with many other illnesses, uh, dual therapy is required. And I think it's a matter of the uh, health professionals to lobby and to push hard for that as a uh, as a management program. Um, I also agree. I mean, uh, um, we we if you look at the studies that have been done so far with the um, uh, the ICS lab formulations, for example, the major thing is massive reduction in exacerbations. And I think we all know that exacerbations are the thing that are costly in asthma care uh, because they mean people miss work, people, uh, and that's an economic cost, and people then come to facilities and so on and so forth. Uh, and um, um, since the majority of our patients all over the world have mild disease and they often decide or make a, a conscious decision that they do not require to be on uh, on uh, on long term treatment, appearance is a real big issue. I think for me, using a fast acting um, uh, bronchodilator together with an inhaled corticosteroids, preferably in the same uh, in the same device, is the answer to that problem. So you reduce those exacerbations, health resource utilization, and it becomes cheaper for everyone, including governments. Yes, what, what, what has impressed me, and I guess I've been using it for many years, is that the fear is that it's very costly. And yes, indeed, the unit cost is very high. But the great advantage is it's for a great majority of patients, they will only use it when needed. Now, you can argue, well, surely maintenance treatment should be given every day. But the reality is that no one on inhaled steroids alone takes it every day. They tend to have periods when they'll use it intensely and periods when they just forget or can't afford or they run out. Whereas if you've got a reliever that contains the steroid, you always have on hand the right treatment. And, and to me, it's this question of it, it is the right treatment for asthma, whereas SABAs are the wrong treatment for asthma, except in very limited circumstances. So um, uh, I guess for... You know, I practiced uh, in the southern tip of Africa all my life, and I, I just see patient behavior as being so much dictated by their social circumstances. Uh, and they try and economize on maintenance treatment, and they will always default to the quickest and easiest and cheapest. We have a question uh, on the chat. We have several ch questions, and I'm trying to fit them in within the context of uh, the flow of discussion. Uh, but it, it's someone asking um, 
that, who's trying to advise for an NGO uh, who has uh, who would like to treat the most common diseases in African countries. Cost is a huge consideration, says, says the doctor, but so is, uh, and so is the longevity of the project. In other words, if they have the most expensive options, they may not be able to afford it for very long. Should we be going towards the ICS LABA suggestion um, and, and I guess asking for any other input? This is an interesting question because I've, I've dealt with MSF um, and uh, Ms. Ms. Sans Frontier and, and, and they took a long hard look saying, can we really afford to make the switch? And I think uh, our problem within the respiratory community is that we still lack uh, pharmacoeconomic arguments from low income countries or low middle income countries. Um, and that work really needs to be done. And currently we can model, we can use all the other methods, but if we don't know the prevalence of people dying correctly, uh, it's very hard to model how many lives we're going to save and how many jobs we're going to save and how many more children will have a suitable education in that context. Um, but uh, maybe in the context of an NGO, this is a wonderful op opportunity to do a pilot study uh, using a well-structured design. If you have the money available, uh, there, there are a number of designs that could be used to, to try and answer that in that low income uh, setting. Um, if, we, if we move on a, a little, uh, Clifford, you mentioned Saba ICS combinations. Do you want to tell us a little more about that and why does that appear in Gina? And if, if so, why or why not? Yep. So that is just the concept. Certainly there, there are ICS SABA combinations available. I know in some countries in Africa, not in South Africa and in the United States. And there was a study published looking at SABA ICS use as opposed to uh, SABA alone showing a, a benefit. And that, that was published, I think, about two years ago. And the concept is that it may just be for um, cost constraints, um, the availability of medication in one inhaler, and um, the GINA guidelines recommend, certainly in track two, that you could use SABA with an inhaled corticosteroid, either as single agent or two different inhalers as reliever therapy, depending which stage you're in. Uh, so that is really the theory behind it. We don't have that available here, and uh, it may make a, an impact from a cost point of view and an availab availability point of view uh, in Africa as a whole, uh, as compared to for motorol combinations. But that's really an alternative that was suggested as to how can we get through this and how what are the possibilities to improve our inhaled steroid exposure. Yeah, so so there are other options, aren't there, of anti-inflammatory reliever therapy, an anti-inflammatory reliever with different uh, types of, of, of steroid and different types of bronchodilator, rapid onset bronchodilator. But the, the difficulty is lack of evidence, and that's why Gina has stuck to what has been uh, very well tested and is indeed now in guidelines in, 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 in many, many countries. Um, the... Uh, I'm going to try and get through some of the questions on on the box. One of the one of the questions is um, uh, concerns. It's a pediatric question. First generation antihistamine antihistaminics uh, seem to be used uh, in children with allergic rhinitis and asthma, um, especially those that are combined with steroids as well. And the question is, should this be discouraged? A combination. I presume, of antihistaminic with a steroid. Um, okay, thank you, Prof. Batesman. I, I think that um, because different countries uh, probably have different um, management rules, but um, as far as the issue of the United Airways is concerned, I, I think if you diagnose allergic rhinitis, then it's helpful to suppress the inflammation as the overall goal, overall outcome would also be that 
you will you improve um suppression of inflammation in asthma as well. So I would think that at the beginning, rather focus on suppressing the inflammation rather than give the, the antihistamines as treatment for allergic rhinitis. But I don't know what um, other countries have as guidelines, but I think if you look at the concept of the United Airways, then it, it has to uh, be that we suppress inflammation because it overall gives improvement to asthma control. Yeah, yeah certainly, certainly the, the Gina and Aria, I think, uh, uh, prioritize, treat the nose as the nose needs to be treated. So and or, an oral antihistamine is, is acceptable. Uh, nasal intranasal steroids do help low respiratory inflammation, but to a lesser extent than if they're inhaled directly. So I think there's a clinical call there. What is the dominant feature and treat each together, but individually? Uh, there's a question here reverting to the Saba discussion is, what do you see in our countries, and uh, speaking of Africa, as the challenges we have in trying to limit Saba, availability of Saba? Uh, some of you uh, mentioned that. Um, do you think this should be a, 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 an active process of trying to have them less available to people with asthma? And I guess the question that's being asked is, would that do harm uh, rather than the good that we're intended? Mm. Who would like to tackle that? That's a tough that's one, for sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry. That, that's a tough one. I mean, uh, um, we have uh, we have matured or rather grown with suburbs. People think they are helpful. People use them and they think they are very useful. And a lot of people will tell you they are not doing any harm to a lot of people because, again, we don't have the data that is needed to be able to tell people that they're doing harm. Uh, but that data is beginning to accrue now, uh, and I think uh, we can make the pitch. Uh, however, it is not going to be um, an easy war. Uh, there is pharma involved, there is uh, governments involved, and all sorts of people. It's going to be, it's going to be a tough war. Um, but that tough war, I think, um, uh, many years ago, I was taught that advocacy has to depend on evidence. If you've got a good evidence, then you use that to uh, carry on with your advocacy efforts. And I think we need to continue showing, uh, even in the African setting, if you look at all these studies that have been done in the African setting, few countries, small numbers of patients, a lot of people don't think that we, we have evidence enough to be able to make a big pitch for uh, change in policy. And that's what we need to do. It may take a while, but that's really what we need to do. Yes, and I guess here there are strategies that are being used in different countries that, that are showing results. Um, and I guess we'll, as we often do, we'll look at those and say, which of those could we apply in our setting? One that comes to mind, that, which would be very simple, or should be very simple, is to put a health warning on the box to say, if you're using more than one, one of these more than every four months, uh, you, you, you need additional treatment. Or you could even put something controversial like, this, this causes temporary relief of symptoms. Uh, it is not... Uh, the correct treatment or is not complete treatment for asthma uh, because people need to be warned that they what they're getting is the equivalent of a paracetamol for a headache it doesn't address the cause it just uh, just gives temporary relief so there are strategies um, uh, anybody else like to address that what other approaches might one take just to quickly say that, could we probably, I, I, I know there are a lot of OTCs where people walk in and try to get um, service. So could they get um, ICS in, in, in instead? Could, could there be some opportunity to rather give that uh, or say, could, could, could you, have you seen this, this is the right one, um, talk, talk to your doctor or some some way that instead of getting several prescriptions for the mm. service, you rather get an option to get an, an, an inhaled corticosteroid 
and you actually are told. But as you said, pharma is involved. It's a big thing. But I'm thinking that maybe we should try to look at that, that if you go to the over-the-counter to get the med, the SABA, maybe you are offered ICS. But that is only if they have a formal diagnosis. So that's also a bit tricky because some of them may actually not even have asthma at all. They doing using that to relieve some other respiratory conditions that may not have an official diagnosis with, with a doctor. So, I, yes, I, I, guess, I guess what you're saying is there's a ro role for the pharmacist. Uh, I, I think what you're suggesting presumes, perhaps presumes too many things, but but in settings, in hospitals, for instance, uh, it's it, easy for pharmacists to say, hang on, we've we've given you six already this year. You know, go back to the doctor, tell us why it is. We'll ask the doctor even to question why it is. Or a, a private pharmacy could do the same, you know, go and see your doctor. They, they're used to giving advice, and I guess they could do something similar. It's interesting, um, uh, Clifford, you spoke about uh, quality standards, and you mentioned... Uh, a, a document produced, I believe, in Canada, but the, the International Union Against Tuberculosis has just come out with a very important document, I think, which was uh, minimal cl uh, clinical sta um, quality standards for management of asthma. And uh, I would really commend that to everyone who's on this. Um, it lays out points that they think are essential. A lot of them we've mentioned already today, and it does put a point, uh, 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 it makes the point that SABA should not be given on their own to adults and and uh, adolescents with asthma. It also makes the point that even in the younger pediatric age groups, uh, the use of inhaled steroids has a very proper place and uh, should be emphasized. And that's viewed as a minimal quality standards, a bit like we have for tuberculosis, which, which helps to guide governments into what they should be putting their money in. So there are other high-level opportunities to change policy. Uh, another one is that uh, the Federation for International Respiratory Societies is, is trying to get a resolution debated at the World Health Organization, at the, at the WHA, to see whether these things we're talking about today uh, can be used to encourage governments to make a change in their, in their prescribing uh, or in their provision for, of, for asthma care. Now, there are a couple of questions here. There's one, where would you use oral theophylline bronchodilator with some anti-inflammatory effects? Um, and uh, I, I think that came up, uh, perhaps, uh, Chikai, would you like to start? What's your place? Uh, what's your pos position? I, on su surprisingly, I still see one or two patients once in a while with being on oral theophilines. But just like Sabas, these things give you very little relief, very short relief, and doesn't protect you against the next one and doesn't protect you against an exacerbation. So uh, I think these are, these are medicines or products that uh, uh, we really shouldn't be using in 2023 going to 2024. Right. What what do you think for children, uh, Sandra? Uh, you're on mute. You're on mute. Sorry. Sorry. I I think that the yeah I would also not recommend theophylines. I think in in Ghana from the Acacia study, as I said, we are about to share the findings. But we found a lot of people use a lot of children get these over the counter from caregivers which are not prescribed, but they continue to have severe symptoms. So I, I think we should emphasize simply that it should be inhaled corticosteroids. Usually when the options become too many, then people tend to get confused, especially in the pediatric population. But the truth is that theophylines, as Prof Chakaya has said, give very little anti-inflammatory effect and, and they are not superior to inhaled corticosteroids. So I think we should en encourage people to stick to simple guidelines that the inhaled corticosteroids would be superior in suppressing inflammation in the pediatric population. Thank you. 
Thank you. I think your point about it deflects people from taking what they should be taking is a very important one. Um, I mean, I've had many patients who, who, who said, no, I, I'm on Theophil. And when I've looked at the cost of it, it's often been as expensive as an inhaled corticosteroid and it's the wrong medicine. So, uh, you know, that's why in the guidelines, most international guidelines, it's either not there or if it's there, it's there in small print uh, and with with concerns about it. Well, we're we're coming to the end of our time. There are additional questions. I'm going to pick up just one that I saw uh, saw here, and um, and that was um, uh, what do you think are minimum investigations uh, in people who who come with recurrent exacerbations, say three or four per year? Uh, in other words, poorly controlled asthma. Clifford, I'm going to give you that, that clear clinical question. Minimum. Minimal so, investigations. I think it's important to know that your patient's got asthma or not. And that's a common problem with people who have recurrent wheezing and may not be asthma. So I think the first thing is to establish, do the peak flows. You don't need to do, if you don't have spirometry available to do your peak flow assessment. Um, you may wish to, with more significant illness, look at um, phenotypes just to see if they're allergic. Skin allergy tests may be helpful both for allergic rhinitis, allergic asthma. It's not going to change your treatment initially. You're still going to need your inhaled steroid. But I would like to emphasize that we need to prove it is asthma, show that there is variable airway obstruction. And um, if you're worried that there may be other pathologies, a simple x-ray, if you have high TB prevalence. Uh, so I think it's really clinically driven as per your patient. Do they really have uh, asthma, other problems, bronchiectasis, but that's a clinical question, and I think you need to establish your diagnosis first as the as the primary uh, process. And uh, I guess close on the heels is, are they taking their medicine? Which I guess uh, in about one in two probably aren't, or if they are, they're not taking what taking all of it. Uh, Absolutely, adherence yeah. is a big issue, isn't it? So, adherence and compliance is vital. Uh, you know, you say to your patient, how are you doing? No, my, I have a lot of symptoms. Uh, are you taking your medicines? Yes, I am. But when you ask them more carefully, uh, as, as you have said, the majority take medicines when they want rather than as regular therapy. So adherence and compliance are vital. Yes, I particularly liked uh, what Dr. Sandra said. She was say, saying that <clears throat> the, the difference, and it came up in the, the talk from Kenya as well, that when you have patients with so-called severe asthma in Africa, most often it's under-treated asthma. It's what we prefer to call problem asthma rather than severe asthma, because that 4.6% uh, is more like the figure of patients who, 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 in spite of all our good treatment as per Gina, have persistent exacerbations and are uncontrolled. So severe asthma is a minority issue. The vast majority of our patients could be helped with steps one, two, three, uh, and not necessarily have to go on to steps four and five. Well, um, sadly, our time is up, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm so grateful to you all for joining us, all those online. And I hope you found something of interest and something that will help you in your daily practice. But more important, I hope it's given you something to think about. Uh, is there something in your practice that needs to change? Are you going to be part of the move to anti-inflammatory reliever therapy, which is unquestionably the way asthma should be treated? Or are, are you going to be constrained by what is available? And uh, I think it's up to all of us to be part of the solution, as uh, Clifford summarized. Uh, it's up to us as physicians to drive the change, which will give our patients better asthma control. Um, so I want to thank our four speakers uh, for three for four, four, uh, three excellent talks. Um, and I really enjoyed the international perspective. It's wonderful to be part of a pan-thoracic organization so that we can talk uh, across these barriers. Uh, and it's amazing how similar our situations are. So thank you for, for all that uh, you contributed to this discussion. So with that, I, I close the session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot.